When the U.S. government hacks its own citizens, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is often the best source of reporting to find out what laws the government has broken. When a change to the privacy policy of Google or Facebook is made, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is often the best place to find out how that change in privacy exploits users. The Electronic Frontier Foundation provides legal defense and editorialism at the intersection of law and technology. Nate Cardozo joins the show today to discuss the mission of the EFF and his work at the organization. We have a wide-ranging conversation, ranging from governments to corporations to Stuxnet to how the internal discussions at the EFF lead to the stances taken by the EFF. I would really like like to know what you think about these types of episodes where I branch off from something that's directly related to software engineering into something that's more at the intersection of software and X. Uh, and if you have any recommendations for these kinds of intersections, I'm definitely looking to do more shows, definitely looking to branch out into more varietal topics, biotechnology, uh, ethics of technology, uh, things that are technical in in nature but may not be technical in their nature of software engineering or software architecture so please send me recommendations for ideas jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com with that i hope you enjoy this episode life is too short to have a job that you don't enjoy if you don't like your job go to hired.com slash se daily Hired makes finding a new job enjoyable, and Hired will connect you with a talent advocate that will walk you through the process of finding a better job. It's like a personal concierge for finding a job. Maybe you want more flexible hours or more money or remote work. Maybe you want to work at Facebook or Uber or Stripe or some of the other top companies that are desperately looking for engineers on Hired. You deserve a job that you enjoy because you're someone who spends their spare time listening to a software engineering podcast. Clearly, you're passionate about software, so it's definitely possible to find a job that you enjoy. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. A $1,000 signing bonus from Hired when you find that great job that gives you respect and salary that you deserve as a great engineer. I love Hired because it puts more power in the hands of engineers. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily to get advantage of that special offer. And thanks to Hired for being a continued longtime sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Nate Cardozo is a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Nate, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I'd like to start with a broad discussion of the EFF. What is the Electronic Frontier Foundation? Uh, Well, we like to call ourselves the nation's leading digital civil liberties group. Uh, We're a 26-year-old nonprofit. We're a 501c3 based in San Francisco, California. Uh, It's our one and only office uh, here in the, the capital of Silicon Valley. And... Our mission is to protect users' rights online, to make sure that uh, that the the people of the world take their rights with them uh, into the digital world. In in the United States, that means making sure our constitutional rights uh, follow us when we go online. And around the world, it makes uh, it's our job to make certain that free expression and privacy and innovation uh, are protected uh, in the digital era. So the EFF provides legal defense in court and also has some blog posts uh it's kind of a kind of a new combination of news outlet and op-ed i would say Uh, but talking about the legal defense how does the eff typically get involved in a case well so we do what we uh what's known in the u.s as impact litigation we don't do legal aid uh we're not we're not a public defender or anything like that Uh, We take cases when we think that we have a chance to make the law better or keep the law from getting worse. Uh, And so we we take cases that have uh, an impact in terms of legal doctrine or case law um, or even sometimes tech. Uh, So we take cases where we think that it's going to help not just the, the, the single person or people that we're defending, um, but we're going to help the world in general. Um, we also write a lot of amicus briefs. These are friend of the court briefs. 
uh, where we can apply our, our legal doctrinal expertise as well as our tech expertise to help the court come to a better uh, resolution of a case than just the parties themselves um, might be able to, to help the court uh, do. Uh, we also do a lot of legislative activism. Uh, we have uh, a paid lobbyist in Sacramento, California, and we have uh, a legislative director who splits his time between San Francisco and DC uh, to to work with uh, with staffers um, both in Washington and around the country to to make laws pr proposed bills better or sometimes make them not so atrociously bad. Um, we also have an activism team that does grassroots activism. And most of the blog uh, that you mentioned, uh, which is our deep links blog at EFF.org, uh, most of those posts are written by our activism team. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, we have a tech projects team and an international team who respectively build privacy protective software, uh, things like HTTPS Everywhere, which is a browser plugin to make certain that you're using uh, TLS if, if websites um, offer it. Uh, and Privacy Badger, which is a an online tracker blocker. Um, and then our international team does all of that, but outside the US. Um, mm -hmm. So we are, uh, we're a small organization in, in some respects. We've got about 60, 65 employees, um, but we do work way outside our weight class all around the world. Oh, okay. Well, so maybe you could talk about a recent case that you have been involved in or a case a high profile case that the EFF has been involved in so for people who are not listening they have an idea, or people who are people who are not listening people who are not familiar with the EFF they could get an idea for what you know is a typical case that the EFF would get involved in sure uh, our our flagship case right now uh, is called Jewel versus NSA uh, it's a class action lawsuit uh, brought by uh, subscribers of AT&T Internet Services against the National Security Agency. Uh, we filed the case in 2008 um, after the NSA's warrantless wiretapping made headlines uh, in, in the USA Today and in the New York Times um, back in 2006. Uh, and, you know, when, when, it, when it became public that the NSA was tapping the, the fiber optic internet cables that form the backbone of the internet right here in San Francisco at the AT&T facility on Folsom Street, uh, we, we first filed a, a lawsuit against AT&T uh, for participating in this uh, illegal and warrantless wiretapping program that the NSA started under the Bush administration. Um, Congress, of course, passed a law uh, giving AT&T retroactive immunity uh, for their participation in that program. And so that that first case was thrown out, and the follow-on case was against the NSA itself for, for orchestrating this illegal wiretapping um, case. So that we filed in 2008. Um, we've been up to the Ninth Circuit twice, um, and we're back down in front of the district court in San Francisco, uh, and we actually just, just this year won the right to take discovery against the NSA. So we, we propounded document demands uh, and NSA's response is due this Friday, um, just a couple of days from now. Okay, so what kind of outcome are you seeking here? What is the uh, goal and um, you know what would you like to see as a result of Jules versus NSA? Well, um, with a lot of our cases, and Jewel is Jewel is no exception, the outcome that we're seeking is get a warrant. Um, we we believe that the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says that when the government wants to conduct a search, they need to get a warrant and a particularized warrant uh, to say, you know, I want to search Jeff Meyerson's. Uh, oh, did that. Okay. Well, yeah, I saw I saw that too. I don't. Uh, this is why I do the client side recordings, also. Yeah. Um, now you're echoing. Yeah, you too. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna refresh. You should go ahead and refresh as well. Okay. 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 Are we back. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna make a new recording. All right. Cool. I have those. Our first recording. Uh, I, that always happens whenever the NSA taps into the <laughs> Zencaster conversation. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, so we're right. good. So what's what's the outcome we're looking for? I think is the uh, 
the question yes. you asked. The outcome we're looking for is that they stop, that they stop recording uh, Americans' internet and phone traffic without a warrant, um, that they stop uh, that they stop searching our communications without a particularized warrant that allows us to search, allows them to search our communications. Um, we think that's what the Fourth Amendment demands. And uh, the first, the Bush administration and now the Obama administration have gone to extraordinary, extraordinary lengths to make sure that no court ever actually rules on that question. And to date, of course, no court has. So is what it, why is <coughs> why would they do that why why are they so intent on preventing this from being ruled on is it is it actually a case where they have you know they just they just want the ability to do this or is this or the, do they believe that uh this this question is so uh so opaque and so you know the world is changing so fast that they are afraid to uh to have any decisive ruling on it um, what is what are the motivations uh, of the NSA here? Well, the 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 clearest motivation that they have is if no court rules on it, then no court is going to tell them to stop, and that so far has worked um, for uh, nearly a decade now since we filed Hepting versus AT and T. Um, you know, the the only courts to have ruled on any of these programs uh, were the courts that held that the 215 program, which is the telephone metadata program, which is a very limited subsection of what they're getting, um, that those, the, the courts to, to look at that, a couple of them held that that program was unconstitutional. Um, and of course, the NSA immediately <coughs> uh, went to Congress and got the law changed um, to, to take that program out of their hands uh, and put it into the hands of the, of the, of the carriers. Um, that happened last year with the passage of the USA Freedom Act uh, in 2015. So I, I guess from the NSA's perspective, uh, justice delayed is justice for them. Um, if, if they don't, if they never get a court ruling, no one will ever tell them to stop. Um, and that, unfortunately, has been an effective strategy for them so far. Now, zooming out, you know, I've heard you talk about security versus privacy. And this this narrative that security and privacy are mutually exclusive, or at least they are, you know, there must be a trade off. If you want more security, uh, you, you you know, you, you ha there has to be less privacy. And you kind of frame this actually as a this is a false dichotomy. This is, this is not actually something where trade offs have to occur. Uh, and in fact, in order to get increased security, you need more privacy. Could you explain your perspective on these two issues and how the trade-off gets misconstrued? Sure. Um, I'll give you a, a, a very concrete example. Um, the 215 metadata program, which ended last year, um, existed in one form or another from uh, early 2002 until 2015. Every single American's phone call was logged. Not the content of it, but who was calling who and when. Um, and those logs were kept for five years uh, and were searched uh, routinely by, by NSA analysts. When, uh, when the Snowden revelations hit, uh, the, the very first story out of Snowden was the, the 215 program. Uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee uh, called the director of the NSA up to Capitol Hill uh, and and demanded an explanation. And the the NSA's first uh, first explanation was, you know, this has this program has stopped hundreds of attacks on America. Um, when pressed for details, it became this program has has disrupted fifty three terrorist plots. When pushed a little bit harder, they said that this program had stopped twelve terrorist plots. And then when actually called to the floor uh, to say what has this program given us, um, it apparently only actually stopped one. Uh, and the terrorist plot that it stopped was a San Diego cab driver um, who attempted to send $8,500 uh, to Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia. That's it. We recorded, we logged every American's telephone call for more than a decade to stop an $8,500 transfer to Al-Shabaab. I mean, that's not a effective security program. Uh, they they, you know, we spent tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars 
uh, on this massively privacy invasive program to stop essentially nothing. Um, and we know it was abused thousands of times. The NSA's own inspector general uh, said that agents routinely abused the, the telephone metadata program. Uh, there, it, the abuse was so common that they even had a, a slang term for it. Uh, you know, in the intelligence community, we call uh, signal intelligence SIGINT, we call human spying HUMINT, uh, and apparently the NSA uh, had a term called LOVEINT for when, uh, when analysts would use the metadata program to keep tabs on current or ex-lovers. Uh, it was common enough to have its own slang term. Um, and that's ridiculous. Wow. Um, hmm. So, so, so it didn't it didn't give us any security. It only harmed our privacy. Uh, you know, we as, as you said, I, I have argued many times that we need both, and that if we uh, if we as a society don't allow members of our society to have privacy, then we can't have any security either. Um, you know, identity thieves uh, are are only have only been stopped. Uh, recently because Apple and Google um, have uh, encrypted the the storage on cell phones by default prior to uh, prior to uh, full disk encryption on cell phones um, three million Americans a year were the victim of identity uh, theft because of lost or stolen phones now that number is close to zero um, and it's because the security of those devices has improved to allow us to have privacy. Now, so it sounds like what you're talking there uh, about in, in terms of your uh, your example of, of a point of criticism of how the the NSA is using this data, the love int uh, example. You know, the problem it sounds like is not necessarily the data collection, but the fact that it gets misused and it, you know it, it i i feel like if if most you know if all if all of this data was being used in a way that was guaranteed to just be directed at preventing terrorism and if we had some uh litmus test for you know are we querying the system with the intent of actually preventing terrorism then you know everybody would agree to that but uh perhaps in practice that is so hard to do that uh, it is not worth infringing on uh, privacy in order to create this type of database. Would you say that's that's a fair argument? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, if there was if there was a perfect computer algorithm that could only detect terrorism and throw everything else out, uh, you know, maybe EFF wouldn't be so opposed. But that that's fantasy. We don't we don't live in that world. Um, we live in a world with wildly imperfect algorithms um, that you know we depend on on regular people to do uh, to do the data analysis um, and and people are flawed you know something to ask yourself with, with any of these tools is you know would you be comfortable handing the tools that the NSA has built to and then insert your absolute nightmare uh, presidential candidate uh, maybe Trump, maybe Clinton, maybe Gary Johnson, I don't know. Um, would you feel comfortable handing the tools that the NSA has built to your worst political nightmare president? And if the answer is no, then we can't have those tools. They're, they're simply too dangerous um, to, be, uh, to be wielded by human beings, which is, which is what they are today. So what about like from the corporate standpoint? So what what is EFF's perspective on on how like what do data corporations have? So like you know for example, I opt into Google having tons of information about me. I opt into Facebook having tons of information about me. Uh I opt into I, Apple having tons of information about me. Oftentimes I'm opting in by virtue of the fact that I'm using these devices that give me incredible power. I'm clicking on some kind of terms of service thing that, that is a wall of text that I'll never read. What is the EFF's perspective when it comes to these data collection programs? Well, we're, we're concerned by them. Um, we, we, we think that the, the Federal Trade Commission's uh, information Fair Information Practice uh, Guide is a good starting place. Um, and what that 
what, what those principles state <coughs> is that private data collection must only occur um, with, uh, with consent and with notice. And if those two principles are, um, are followed, then generally speaking, it's not that bad. Uh, you know, if, if you know uh, and if you consent to your data being collected by Google or Facebook, you know, it, it is what it is. You, you have the right to, to give your personal data over to Google and Facebook. The difference between Google and Facebook and the NSA is, uh, is threefold. Um, first, NSA isn't getting our consent and they certainly didn't give us notice that they're collecting all this data on us. Um, and then second and, and, and maybe more important, Google and Facebook don't have the power to throw us in jail if we do something they don't like. The worst that Google and Facebook can do is cut us off, uh, and they don't even really have a, uh, a history of doing that. So uh, corporate data collection is, is a significant problem, um, and I'll give an example in, in, in a second, but it's nothing like, uh, like the NSA. You can choose not to use Google. You can choose not to use Facebook. You can't choose not to be a part of the NSA's dragnet. Um, where, where we do get involved, so let me back up uh, for a little bit. Uh, EFF is not, generally speaking, a consumer privacy uh, organization. We, we, do quite, we do some consumer protection work, but that's not our bread and butter. Our bread and butter is civil liberties, uh, and in the, in the American tradition, civil liberties means your rights vis-a-vis -vis the government. Where we get involved in consumer protection work or consumer privacy work is where the government corporate line blurs. Uh, I filed a, a Federal Trade Commission complaint against Google last December for their practices uh, in Google Apps for Education. Um, so this is the suite of, of branded Google Apps that, that school kids use uh, all across the country. They're awesome. They're actually quite secure. Um, much more secure than, than email systems run by school districts, for instance. So in, in that respect, they're great. Um, they're also free uh, to, to districts. The problem is Google isn't honest about what data they're collecting. Um, Google uh, signed something called the Student Privacy Pledge, where they said they wouldn't collect personal data without getting student or parent consent. Um, unfortunately, they've interpreted that pledge to only cover the Google Apps for Education core suite and not cover things like Google Search or YouTube or Maps or Blogger or Google News. Um, so Google is collecting data on our school children um, and using it for whatever purpose they choose, um, even though they've promised not to. So when, and, and, and the reason we got involved there is because districts around the country uh, are requiring students to use this. They're not even allowing an opt out in many cases. Um, so when, when the government requires that children give their personal data to Google for Google to do whatever it wants with, um, that's when EFF gets involved. Hmm. Now, why did we get to a place where it feels like, I think your, your response uh, to this type of data collection, uh, as well as your response to the data collection of the NSA, is characteristic of a tenor in the public dialogue that is sort of like, uh, we don't want to make this trade-off between, um, you know, this this trade-off between privacy and utility. I mean, we were talking about privacy and security earlier. Uh, I think, you know, um, when we're t when it comes to corporate services like Facebook or Google, the trade-off we're making more is like privacy versus utility. You give up, if you give up less data, you get less utility in terms of, you know, how these services are learning to accommodate you. Um, but uh, it, you will also be, uh, you will also be maintaining more privacy. And so, so for me, speaking personally, I like I am very open to giving up basically as much data uh, as I can to these services because I basically trust that w with the data that I give up, it's going to make my experience on the service asymptote towards something that is going to be more useful to me. Um, now, is I, I feel like that belief for me uh, is is rare, and and uh, among most people, they would say I don't want to give up 
this type of information because I'm not sure how it's going to improve my service. Um, and and me, on the other hand, I'm just more willing to, to give up that information because I'm, I feel I'll asymptote more quickly towards that great service experience. It, so is that is that because I'm like uh, just you know a white male living in America? I have very little to fear. I've never had issues of prejudice. I've never had issues of um, you know being uh, ostracized by my my society. Uh, what you know what guides the different personas of people in terms of how they view this trade off between utility and privacy? Well. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, how clearly people realize that they do have something to hide. Um, when, when, whenever I hear that argument, you know, I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to worry about, um, that's sort of an unexamined position. <coughs> I mean, everybody has something to hide in, in some respect, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a topical example here. Um, Cash Hill published a piece in Fusion uh, earlier this week about... Uh, uh, clients of psychiatrists uh, being suggested as friends to each other on Facebook. I saw this. Right. So even though, uh, you know, y y you don't necessarily have anything to hide, the fact that Facebook figured out that you and someone you don't know are both patients of a psychiatrist, that has some privacy implications. Um, and it can get a lot worse from there, right? Uh, you know, what if uh, you, you you pointed out that you know you're a white male, you're you're relatively privileged existence, um, but what if you were, uh, you know, what what if you were an LGBT activist living in the Middle East? What if you uh, were uh, a, a civil rights organizer here in the United States? There are any number of reasons why you might want to have different spheres in your life. Um, and that's, that's really, that's really the thing is, you know, I have, I have multiple different circles in my life. I have my, my colleagues here at EFF. I have my college friends. Uh, I have high school friends. I have a, a set of board gaming friends and I have a set of friends who I communicate with, uh, over signal, um, who don't fit into any of those buckets. And I wouldn't necessarily want any of those other buckets learning of the existence of the people who I talk to um, over Signal, um, I wouldn't want those people popping up in my, in my college friend's Facebook feed. I wouldn't want um, EFF to know about some of the people I talk to. Um, you know, what if I was applying for, for a job uh, at, at Google right now, for instance? I'm not, so that's I, I don't think Google would ever hire me, and I'm not sure I'd ever work there. Um, but let's pretend for the sake of argument that I was applying for a job at Google. I wouldn't want EFF to know about that. It's not that I have anything to hide. It's just that I have different privacy expectations in different contexts. Um, mm. You know, I'm happy to have Google know that I work at EFF, I'm not happy to have EFF know that I'm applying to work at Google. Uh, and it's it's the consumer expectation, it's, it's the average person's expectation that their choices to keep different parts of their life separate, when that's violated, we intuitively feel that that's creepy. Um, and that, that feeling, that intuitive feeling that something is creepy is an indication that, uh, that your privacy is being violated in some way. Continuous integration is so useful that I've started using it on my own personal projects. SnapCI from ThoughtWorks has the fastest setup I've ever seen. I registered for SnapCI with my GitHub account, and after a few clicks, I had continuous integration pipelines set up for a Node.js application and a Rails application that were just sitting on my GitHub account. And I don't want my users to experience breaking changes, so I want to run a large suite of tests for my application every time I push a change. And SnapCI will run those tests quickly, in parallel, on a worker that SnapCI spins up and takes care of for me. Whether you have personal projects like me, or you work at a company that is looking for the perfect tool to improve the deployment process, go to snap.ci slash softwareengineeringdaily. SnapCI embodies the lessons that ThoughtWorks has learned from 20 years of software deployment, the same lessons that have been written about by Martin Fowler and Jez Humble. 
Check it out at snap.ci slash software engineering daily. It would support software engineering daily and you would get to check out continuous deployment. Snap.ci slash software engineering daily. Thanks for listening. So let's say you you are working at one of these companies and you are let's say you're an advisor to Mark Zuckerberg, you're an advisor to Larry Page or not Larry Page, um, Sundar Pichai, and they have basically tasked you with saying, Okay, Nate, we want you to figure out what are like how can we keep up our improvements in services that are totally reliant on this or largely reliant on this massive stream of data about how users are using the service, uh, who their friends are, what kinds of conversations they're having. Um, how can we maintain this while also providing uh, the, the right uh, configurations for privacy? Because as we've seen, these privacy settings that you know can be presented on Facebook or Google, most of the time people just don't even use them or they don't know how to use them. And when these services try to impose like, hey, set your privacy settings, users are just like, well, this is really inconvenient and annoying and I don't care about this. So how would you advise these companies to actually uh, let people tune the knobs how they want to? Well, so there, there are two, two main things that, that companies can do. Um, the first is not use data outside the context in which it was given to the company. So um, like if I click the like button on Facebook on a, you know, a company's web page, let's say I really like, oh, I don't know, um, Juan Valdez coffee, uh, and I click like on Juan Valdez, I expect that information at some level to be used to show me ads for coffee, either Juan Valdez coffee or their competitors, um, or maybe ads for energy drinks, or maybe ads for beverages in general, or maybe even food ads, but de definitely ads. Um, if I uh, if I use WhatsApp to communicate with someone in, I don't know, Lebanon, and WhatsApp gives that fact to Facebook, and I start seeing ads for travel in Lebanon, that's a lot more worrying because I gave that information, I, I gave WhatsApp the information that I'm talking to someone in Lebanon to allow me to talk to someone in Lebanon. Uh, and I don't expect it to be used to show me ads on a different platform in a different context. Um, so that's number one, it's using the information only in the context in which it was given to the company. Um, and then the second is, there are ways of delivering the same or almost the same service without collecting that kind of information. And I'll, I'll give a concrete example. Um, it, an Android phone, which has access to your calendar and has access to your email uh, and has access to your GPS location, will tell you when you're leaving your house um, that you know it'll take 48 minutes to get to work, or it will or it will preemptively say, you have an appointment at, uh, at EFF at 9.30, you have to leave earlier than you usually do because of traffic conditions. The way that Google does that processing is all on the back end. All of that processing happens on Google servers. Um, my iPhone will give me the exact same notification. Um, if I have my, my calendar stored on my iPhone, if I have my email stored on my iPhone, if I have location services turned on on my iPhone, my iPhone will say, you know, traffic is exceptionally heavy. You have to leave 15 minutes earlier than you usually do to get to your appointment because it knows where my appointment is because it's there. But in Apple's, in Apple's version of the exact same service giving me the exact same information, nothing ever leaves my phone. It's the phone itself that does that calculation that uh, that determines my habits uh, and doesn't it doesn't pass any of that information on to Apple. Um, that is a radically different way of thinking about how to deliver what amounts to the exact same service. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of those companies makes its money selling hardware and the other company makes its money selling ads about me. Uh, you know, selling, essentially selling me. Um, the, the other makes its money selling to me. Uh, and both 
give me the same service and one is pretty problematic in terms of privacy and the other is really kind of not problematic. Um, mm. And, you know, you can you can do that engineering. You, you can apply that same engineering principle to any number of services. Uh, and I, I wish that companies would do more of that. Mm. OK, so I want to shift the conversation back to talking about the government, because, as you said, this is the you know, the flagship case. It involves the government. Um, and I think a lot of the conversations around the EFF are uh, more centered around consumers versus the government as opposed to uh, consumers um, versus corporations. I mean, there are both, but you, you recently wrote a post about what you call government hacking, and it was called Why We Shouldn't or we should we shouldn't wait another 15 years for a conversation about government hacking and one big part of this post that you wrote is that we don't really have clear enforceable rules for government activities like hacking and digital sabotage and this you know this is parallel with what you said earlier about how Basically, the gov- what the government is, is fighting against uh, right now in terms of the NSA stuff is they don't want this ruled on. They don't want a concrete definition for what they cannot do. So why why is it problematic? Like Why is this theme of there not being clear, enforceable rules for government activities, why is this so problematic? Well, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a jungle out there. Um, Without enforceable rules, we get things like, um, do you, you, you know, I, I assume your audience is familiar with what a stingray is, but very briefly, a stingray is a, a fake cell tower that's operated by the cops, and it's used for a number of different things. The most common thing it's used for is locating a, um, a subject's cell phone. Uh, until last year, there were no real rules, uh, certainly not at the federal level on how and when stingrays should be used. We saw uh, police departments, for instance, in Baltimore using stingrays in specifically African-American neighborhoods all the time without legal process or with barely any legal process. Uh, And these things can have pretty serious unintended side effects. Uh, They um, the, the way that they work, they cause all cell phones within about a 200 meter radius, which is several city blocks, to connect to them instead of the, the real AT&T or Verizon or Sprint cell tower. Um, and that can cause disruption in 911 calls. Uh, it can cause uh, people to, to lose connectivity altogether. Um, these devices can also be configured to intercept uh, voice conversations or cell or, uh, or text or data. Um, and they were being run certainly without a warrant and often without any legal process whatsoever. Uh, and even worse, the cops were lying to courts about their use. Um, that's not the way that the American justice system is supposed to work. Um, in, in, in another context, uh, in, in a hacking context, there was a, an investigation a couple of years ago into a, a huge and really quite awful uh, child pornography site um, that was a Tor hidden service called Playpen. Um, the FBI found uh, the, the operator of that site, found the server, seized the server, and then ran the server for about two weeks, um, distributing child porn to, to thousands of people around the world, and also distributing uh, malware, a, a piece of, of FBI malware which they've termed a network investigative technique or a NIT, um, which we would term a remote access tool or a RAT, uh, it's the same thing, to find the IP addresses of the the people accessing this Tor hidden service. And which they, is like entrapment. Uh, it's not technically entrapment, but in, in, the colloquially, in the colloquial sense, it was entrapment. The problem is they cut a bunch of corners in this investigation. They could have done it right. Um, but instead, they got a, a facially insufficient warrant to allow them to hack everyone who attached or who, who logged into this site, whether or not they were actually uh, looking at, at child porn or distributing child porn. Uh, and then the, the tool that they used is classified. It's apparently still being used in other intelligence contexts. And so now that uh, that over a hundred defendants have been charged, 
the defense experts aren't getting access to the tool that the FBI used to hack them. So we can't test its reliability. We can't test, um, you know, if it was actually doing what the FBI says it's doing. And we have to essentially take the FBI's word for the the technical capabilities of this tool, the the accuracy of this tool, the reliability of this tool, um, and these these people are going to trial on what amounts to secret evidence. Um, and the reason that this was possible is because there aren't rules. There, are, there aren't even binding guidelines on how the FBI uh, hacks a computer. Um, in, in the wiretapping context, we have a very uh, well laid out set of rules. Uh, in Title III, which is the Wiretap Act, um, we, we have a, a set of rules where the, the government has to obtain a specialized kind of warrant, which is even harder to get than a regular warrant. Um, only certain types of crimes uh, can can result in a wiretap order. And then there are minimization requirements. You know, if it's if it's Carmela Soprano talking instead of Tony, the FBI can only listen for 90 seconds before they have to hang up. Um, we don't have any of those rules in, in computer exploitation yet. And that's what we need. We need to get to the situation mm -hmm. where um, where the where, where hacking or other types of computer exploitation are a uh, a, a well-oiled, well-regulated tool in the FBI's toolbox, um, mm. and that everybody knows what the rules are, how how it can be used, how it can't be used, and what protections for innocent people there are in place. Because right now there are none. Now th the. The people in these government organizations are the smarter, more technical ones. Are the people that are smart and technical, are they open to the idea of having more solid rules around this? Because whenever I, whenever I see a narrative about, you know, somebody in an organization uh, like this that uh, is is very bullish on just like, oh, totally unregulated um, free reign over user data and stuff like those fake cell towers. My sense is always that it's like the less technical people in these organizations that are like, oh, we want to just be able to, we want to be able to do whatever we want. And there's no way that we could ever have rules around this. Um, what's your sense of like the perspective of, of, of the, the more technical people in these organizations? Well, so I, I, I think you're right. I think it's the lawyers and the cops who, who don't want any rules. Um, the, the cops have always seen the Fourth Amendment as a hindrance to their work, and in a sense it is, right? We, we have a Fourth Amendment to make law enforcement jobs harder, not easier. Um, the techs that I've talked to, uh, frankly, they all thought that those rules were already in place. Um, <laughs> they, the, the, the technical people in the intelligence community believe that the the use of these tools are well regulated um, because the their lawyers up up at the in the front office of FBI or NSA um, wrote them a memo saying this is this is what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Um, the problem is they're being lied to, frankly, um, by the higher ups. Uh, there 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 are no binding rules in the sense that if the rules are violated, there's any consequence. There may be internal guidance, but that's not a rule, and we need rules here. Right. So the higher ups are like waving their hands to the the lower people and just saying, "Yeah, it's fine." Um, you know, I I, I kind of want to use this to segue into a conversation around Stuxnet. Um, I just recently watched this movie Zero Days. Have you seen that yet? I didn't. Um, I read Kim Zetter's book. Uh, Okay, but, so uh, you you know this topic. Yeah, I know the, I, I know the topic. Well. I, I would point out that I think it's my understanding, at least, that the movie turned Kim Zetter's character into a man, which is vaguely offensive, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so, you know, what, what, what I found interesting about Stuxnet is like, um, well, there's a number of interesting things, but it, related to the conversation we we're just having, you know, you have this giant team of people working on this project that was super complex, um, and you know, you needed seven hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of zero day exploits to make it work. Um, but you know what I think is interesting? Do you do you get the perspective that like 
it's the same for the, so the people that were working on Stuxnet they probably had the perspective that oh this is totally legal this has you know this has some sort of legal precedent around it um, or do you think that they were working uh, in a sense where they're like okay this is totally the wild west and there's no rules around this and that's okay like we need to build something that uh, that is going to disable Iran's centrifuges i mean i i guess this would be totally a guess um so maybe it's not worth discussing um i don't know like uh both frankly um, okay so the the way that american law works is uh essentially what we do outside the u.s if it doesn't involve u.s persons is kind of a-okay um so in in one sense stuxnet was was legal what what NSA did is was under U.S. law perfectly legal, probably. Um, right. For for Stuxnet, in the in the international law sense, of course it's illegal, but so is everything that the NSA does. Um, so NSA has you know spies are going to spy. That's just what spies do, uh, and analysts who work there are are perfectly happy with 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 that. Um, right. Okay. So so what was problematic? Yeah was maybe that Stuxnet laid this blueprint for cyber warfare. Yeah, um, which, I mean, the, the the law of war is not, you know, other than like the Geneva Conventions, aren't binding in the United States. Uh, and whatever whatever NSA does, whatever the, because the, NSA is the military, right? It's part of the Department of Defense. Whatever the military does in terms of offensive operations abroad, that's type, Title 10 stuff. That's all legal under U.S. law, um, and it, it's it's really when those same tools are turned inward uh, that we start getting into very thorny legal ground very quickly. Right. And so the one of the the mm-hmm. messages of this film Zero Days was that we have international standards for how nuclear weapons can be used and we should develop standards for how cyber weapons are used is it is this feasible is it feasible for us to develop something similar for cyber weapons to the standards that we have for nuclear weapons i don't know maybe um you know the standards that we have for conventional weapons i don't know if they've been a particularly good success right we we have standards for when um, what's typically called kinetic warfare is permissible. Um, but I don't know if those standards have worked in any real sense. Uh, there's, there's something called the Tallinn Manual, um, which is being developed at the NATO, I want to say, level, or maybe the UN level, um, which, is, which is an attempt to... Dis- it, it's not an attempt to set, it's merely an attempt to describe uh, international law with regard to cyber warfare. Um, that attempt has been uh, accepted in some spheres, ridiculed in others, um, and certainly nobody follows it. So I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic that something is possible. Um, I think it'll probably be violated just like we violate every other uh, international uh, set of norms around around warfare. Hmm. And in relation to <clears throat> the other countries that have great capabilities for these cyber weapons is there a sense of mutually assured destruction like are are, are we are, you know can we can we safely say we're not going to degrade into uh, cyber catastrophe because nobody is going to is going to pull the trigger because of mutually assured destruction uh i i wish that were true and i i <laughs> don't really think it is um, right now, the the thing that's holding us back is not the concept of mutually assured destruction. Uh, destruction, it's the concept of attribution. Um, you know, the 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 Chinese, the Russians, the Israelis, the Americans are all, and you know, the Iranians and the North Koreans are all very actively attacking each other, but they're still doing it um, in. The, 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 the Americans more so than the rest of the, the actors I just mentioned are still doing it in a way to try and hide where the attacks are coming from. Um, the, the, the NSO, I mean, not the NSO, the shadow brokers dump uh, from a couple of weeks ago was really interesting in large part because it was very strongly attributable to NSA. We know that the tools that were dumped by shadow brokers 
really are NSA tools. And so now the, the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans and the Iranians can go back and look through their logs. Um, and with, when they see those same attack signatures, they know they're American. Avoiding attribution is the primary uh, break right now on, on cyber war, not the concept of mutually assured destruction. Um, we, I, I don't think we've gotten there. Um, Stuxnet was by far the biggest, most advanced attack that we know about, and it frankly was barely destructive. You know, it uh, it destroyed a few hundred centrifuges or a few thousand centrifuges in a single lab. Um, the the Russians uh, look like they've destroyed one electrical installation in Ukraine. Um, we know of, of, or we suspect, several other small isolated attacks. Um, Oh, kin kinetic attacks using cyber, but we're, we're not there yet. Like, I don't think China could, could press a button and, and take our electric grid offline any more than, than we can take a press a button and, and take theirs offline. Um, maybe oh, okay, that's so somewhere down the line, but it's, we're not there yet. Right. So I find that interesting because that is in contrast to what a lot of people argue. Um, I can't remember this guy's name. There was some guy who came out of the government, a while ago, who was just very much fear mongering, the Chinese are going to shut down our electric grid. Um, is there, is there, I guess, is this narrative beneficial to the the government, uh, the government's narrative around the NSA? And we do need to, we need to continue collecting all this data because our power grid and so on is super vulnerable. Or, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I'd love your perspective on what about this potential digital catastrophe is fact and what is fiction you know i'm 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 just a lawyer <laughs> i'm kind of the wrong person to ask that question that's fair yeah that, that, that's fair okay um so you know getting back to the eff um there's you know my my what i admire about the eff is there's there seems like there's a willingness to take these strong opinionated points of view and my, I often get the impression that the EFF is really not looking to make friends with anyone. There's, you know, not the government, <laughs> not the media, not any companies. Um, and I, I'm just curious, how how do you institutionalize that? Like, uh, you know, you, there's a number of smart, opinionated people at the EFF. Uh, is there a notion of consensus? Do As the EFF, do you have to come to a consensus within the organization, or is it uh, a bunch of opinionated people arguing with each other and you just get, you know, you, you get a certain topic that you have dominion over. How exactly does consensus work at the EFF? Um, well, we're small enough that we're all in one office. Um, we, we, we have a legal team meeting every week where all of the lawyers and all of the other people on legal team come and sit down. We have an all hands meeting every single week. Um, and then all of the other teams have weekly meetings and that's where we make our decisions. Um, you know, when we decide to take a case, it's usually, it's it's not even usually the legal team, it's usually either the civil liberties team or the intellectual property team. We sit down, we talk through an issue, and we come to usually consensus, almost always consensus. Um, and part of that is uh, our, our executive director, who is previously our legal director, Cindy Cohen, has, has assembled a team of people who feel extraordinarily passionate about these issues. Um, no one ended up at EFF by mistake. This was not anyone's second choice. Uh, pretty much everyone here could leave and, and double or in some instances triple their salary. Um, so we're here because we believe in the mission. Um, you know, when when I uh, when I got uh, uh, when I got a, a bug up my butt to file this FTC complaint against Google, I, I, I did some research, I developed the, the factual summary, I had an intern do, do some background uh, legal writing on it, and then I came to, to the legal team meeting and I said, here's what I want to do, here's why I want to do it. Everyone looked at it and said, sounds, sounds good, go do it. And that's what we did. Um, and that's, that's typically the way decisions are made. Um, and it, it works because we all care about these issues, we all have a background in these issues. Um, and we respect each other enough to, to talk it through and come to a place where everybody's comfortable. I can't really mm -hmm. think of a, a case that um, that has caused a lot of dissent here at EFF. 
Um, hmm. Maybe that's because Cindy hired a bunch of like-minded people. Maybe it's because we only take cases that really make sense. I don't know. <clears throat> so what's your sense for how the EFF has changed in the years since it was founded? It was 26 years ago. Obviously, the role of technology in our lives has dramatically increased. How has the role of the EFF changed? Um, well, the first thing is we're bigger. We're, when, when I joined EFF in 2009, we had 26 people. Um, I was number 27, I think. Uh, and now we have 65 or 70. I don't even know uh, how many people we have. Um, so we can do a lot more work. Uh, when I joined, we had one activist. Uh, we had two technologists. Now we have, you know, seven or eight computer scientists and seven or eight activists. Um, so we're able to just take on a lot more. Um, the the intellectual property team was added to EFF uh, in the in the mid two thousands um, because we realized that in in order to protect our rights online, we had to get involved in fighting the DMCA, um, in in fighting the right to uh, fair use. Things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Just so that that that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is we're just able to do more, uh, which is great. Um, and also, we have more expertise in house. Uh, it, you know, if if I want to uh, to get really deep in the woods or deep in the weeds on you know uh, IP addressed trust ratings and how Cloudflare throws a captcha in front of Tor browser users, um, I can go upstairs. And have a technologist uh, sit down for with me for four hours, and when I'm done, I, I understand how this stuff works. Um, hmm. That didn't used to be true. We didn't used to have the resources to be able to do that. Yeah, pretty unique organization. So, uh, last question: <coughs> My sense is that if you compared the the attitudes of somebody from the United States, like average citizen from the United States, to the attitudes of the EFF versus comparing somebody who's a citizen of the EU to the attitudes of the EFF, the attitudes of the person from the EU would be more closely aligned with the EFF. Um, could you give me uh, give me your impression for how the attitudes of the EU, d from like the citizenry and the way that legal proceedings uh, involving tech companies and the government, how does that differ from what goes on in the United States? Um, well, a big difference is the the way that the that the Europeans have decided to balance privacy versus free expression compared to us. Um, I, I might actually push back and say that the the average American might agree more with with many of EFF's positions than the average okay. European. Um, we we have a constitutional right to free speech here. We don't have a constitutional right to privacy. I mean. The, the, the courts have found a penumbral right to privacy in the Constitution, but it certainly is it's not there. It's not there in the plain text. Um, and the way that that balances in EFF's legal work here is we usually put free speech ahead of privacy. Um, we think that it should be legal for a media organization to fly a drone uh, over your house uh, and, and photograph your or you know, ne at least near your house, if not directly over it, and photograph your yard. Um, the European conception might be very different along those lines. Um, the right to be forgotten is a is a good example. So in in Europe, uh, if if you petition to have search results uh, eliminated for something that happened a long time ago that that you think is no longer relevant about yourself, um, you can do it, and Google can be forced to de-index uh, you know, a news report about how you once burned down your house many years ago if that's no longer relevant. Um, here in the US, <clears throat> Google's right to free expression to, to, to build their algorithm however they choose and to report on facts uh, trumps any potential right to privacy. Um, I, I'm not saying that either one of those is better than the other. There are, there are certainly benefits to placing privacy ahead of free expression. But uh, we in the United States, generally speaking, when privacy and free speech uh, come head to head, free speech wins. And in Europe, when privacy and free speech come head to head, privacy wins. EFF is usually on the free expression side of that debate. Interesting. Okay, well, Nate, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, this was a, 
unusual show. Most of the times, you know, I'm doing a show about some kind of software engineering technology or a database or something, and uh, I like to branch out now and then. And and this was a this was a great example of that. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.